I, I realized as I was sitting with our confirmation students this morning, I woke up particularly energized this morning. And so I hope you're feeling the same. If you're not, maybe uh, you can catch it a little bit this morning. Uh, but all that to say, I was reminded as we were singing this morning, uh, and I was, I was kind of captivated in by the words of the song, a few extra amens came out of my mouth. If they come out of yours, it's okay this morning. I'm just giving you permission right now, okay? Because we're talking about redemption and the work that's done through Jesus Christ in your life, in mine, and in the body of believers. And I think that deserves a few amens, hallelujahs, and a few other things. So don't be afraid this morning. We're rounding out this sermon series that we've been doing for five weeks where we're talking about uh, Jesus, particularly five truths about Jesus. We've talked about the fact that Jesus is real. Like he really actually existed in history, but then he didn't go away. I mean, he still exists. Uh, We talked about the fact that Jesus himself claimed to be God. I believe him. I hope you do too, because the claims seem to have a good foundation. And we need that if we're going to be saved, you see, because we need somebody who's fully God and fully human, because we talked about the issue of sin. And we talked about the fact that Jesus never sinned, but we do. You and I, if you're sitting in this room, if you're standing on the stage, you have sinned in this life. It's separated you from God. And the, the profundity of sin is that it continues to separate us from God, and it turns our world upside down, and we think it's not upside down. And so it becomes a problem. And that's why Jesus needed to save Because the the relationship that we had with God that we were supposed to have has been broken by sin. Be holy as I am holy. That's the call that God gives from Old Testament to New. We're supposed to be in that relationship with the one who is holy, but sin keeps us from that. And without Jesus Christ taking that issue out of the picture, making us able to be uh, drawn to the one who is holy and stand in his presence, we cannot be saved. We're left to our own devices, and that becomes problematic very quickly. And so today I want to talk about the issue of redemption. I'm going to pick out two things that are redeemed in Jesus Christ. Scripture picks out more than that, but I want to pick out two broad sort of categories that are redeemed. And the very fact of the matter is that we get new birth through Jesus Christ. That's the salvation that we have. But just as when my three kids were born... And and if you've had kids born in your home, or frankly, if you were a kid at one point, no parent ever says, well, they're a baby now, I expect the same thing in 20 years. They'll be a baby in 20 years. No, we know they're going to grow. The same thing when we come to know Jesus Christ. When we receive that salvation through Jesus Christ, we are supposed to grow. There's new life that comes with that. There's a redemption that has come. And provide something more uh, as we walk with Christ. And we've, we've hung this sermon series on the passage from 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to stand before God as one approved. A worker who is not ashamed and correctly handles the word of truth. I challenged you to memorize it. Take the challenge. It's, it's nice to have that locked in there. I've appreciated it over the last few weeks. I can pray it. And and I can begin to try and live it even more. Do your best to stand before God as one approved. We're supposed to be able to be in the presence of the one who is holy, drawing closer and closer to him. We have to take care of sin. Jesus does that for us. But then we have to walk this path with Christ to be able to be there. And as we draw close to the one who is holy, we begin to be changed in the process, inside out. And we respond to the world that we live in in different ways. So we're going to have a godly character, a more Christ-like nature, and we'll respond to our world in a more Christ-like and godly way. Not holier than thou, but holy. There's a difference, right? It removes our pride from the situation if things are going right. And as I say this, I want us to recognize that sometimes this seems very unachievable. And some people hear this and they hear, well, this is the way that maybe saints of old could live. This is the way that maybe super Christians or elite Christians or people who are really good can live. But I'm a garden variety Christian. No, you're not. There's no such thing. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. You're either walking that path with Christ to draw close to the one who is holy, redeemed by our Savior Jesus Christ, or you're not. You've either accepted it or you haven't, received it or you haven't. And so know that. I don't say that as a discouragement, but an encouragement. If you say yes to Christ, we're all in the same church. 
we're all the saints walking this path together. And that's good news. And this morning we're going to look uh, at, at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. If you're following along in a, on a phone, in a Bible, that's where we're going to plant ourselves this morning. Um, and as we do that, I want to ask a couple questions to get in there. The first is, do you believe this morning that you have value? I mean, that, that you really matter in this world, that if you were gone, it would matter. Do you believe, secondly, this morning as you sit there, that you have purpose? Not just that you need to do the job on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or that you have assignments due for class and that kind of purpose. Not just that you have kids that maybe uh, need you or something like that. Do you believe you have purpose, a deep purpose? More to the point, do you believe this morning as you're sitting there in your pew, Do you believe this morning that God offers you those things, value and purpose? We're going to drill into this part of Ephesians 4 in just a moment, where it talks about unity of the body and what that produces. And so in some ways, that's an effect of the redemption and the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. And in some way, it propels us towards those very things. But but I want to start with this. Uh, I hope, I don't know what kind of music you like. I like a lot of different kinds of music. But the one that, that speaks to my soul, I've discovered, is gospel music. It just drills right in there. Um, it, just, it just moves, moves me. And, and I like the themes of victory and blessing that are there. I like the music. I like the way it builds. I mean, I like a lot of music, but this, this one just does it for me. Uh, there's, a, there's one uh, the, uh, song by Hezekiah Walker that I've been listening to recently where he's got the, the choir behind him. And I don't care if it's old or new gospel music. I kind of like the in-between stuff the best, probably. The choir behind him. And they go through four cycles of, of the, the song that they're singing. They're three minutes into the song. They've done one key change, but no harmonies yet. And you're aching for it, right? It, it just needs it. And finally they come. and You're just drawn in. It's the music. It's the themes. It's everything that brings me in. Now, I remember sitting at a gospel choir concert uh, in Chicago back in my college days nearly 20 years ago now, and, and I was sitting there, and the, the, the director, he was doing an interlude between songs with this gospel choir, and, and he was talking about racial righteousness and some really wonderful themes that he was picking up on that are coming up in the song. He said, do you ever just pray in the church for unity? And I remember it was one of those moments where a preacher, he wasn't really preaching, but he was. It felt like it just came right to me, like, well, I don't do that. I was sitting there, it's like he's talking directly to me. Do you ever pray for unity in the church? No, I don't. Gosh, I should pray for unity. So now I do. I pray for unity in the church all these years later. And that's what Paul gets at right here. He gets at unity within the church. And that's an effect of us coming to know Christ and the redemption that we get through Christ. And so let's look at what Paul says here. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 Incidentally, I'm going to hold that together because in the original Greek, that's one long sentence. It's like four in my English translation. Paul wrote long sentences, and you can get away with it in Greek. Paul says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and then the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, just so I don't disappoint you this morning, I'm not going to unpack all of those different gifted people this morning. That's not what we're going to do. That's for another day. Continuing on. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead... Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Two simple truths we can latch on to this morning. They're going to sound very similar. First is when you receive Christ, you receive life. Something changes. When you receive Christ, you receive life. Now, let me get philosophical for a moment on an idea of worldviews. 
I've been reading uh, recently from Christian apologists uh, and listening to Christian apologists just because I'm fascinated by it uh, as they unpack different worldviews and religious worldviews uh, that are out there. And what's really interesting is that uh, if within the, uh, the world of secular humanist, basically atheist writing, you know, if you can't touch it, taste it, smell it, or feel it, it doesn't exist, that world, within that world of atheism, uh, there are authors who are now starting to get honest with the fact that if you eliminate God from your worldview, it is really not just hard but impossible to propose that there is any inherent value to human life. It, it just is. The only value that I have in that worldview is what I give it to myself. But that might have very negative ramifications for you. right? I might not value you, but there's no sort of backbone to that value that's there. And, and really, in that worldview, uh, you are answerable to no one because there's nothing coming after this life. There's no judgment. There's nobody to judge. If you take that worldview to its nth degree, you should be able to do whatever you want. The only limitations are pain and the law, basically. Right? Those are your major limitations. But you should be able to seize the day and do whatever you want within that worldview if you take it to the nth degree. Another issue that comes with that is if you actually kind of take that worldview and tweak it a little bit and suggest that maybe I can care for somebody else, even if you know, arbitrarily put that sort of value on somebody else and future generations, uh, what's interesting to me and, and came to, I had not thought about this, is that we should all probably be vegetarians. Because if we're just the product of parts and pieces coming together over the centuries within that worldview and there's no God behind it and there's no inherent value, Something could supersede us along the way that then could, just like we put cows in feed yards and eat them, could do the same to us, right? So we have a few problems if there's no inherent value to humanity that's there. Now, I bring that up not because I think that I'm standing here in a room full of atheists. I bring that up because sometimes we mash together the, some of those thoughts without realizing it with a worldview that has God but fairly disconnected from our world. God is, is a little bit distant. We're not drawn that close to him or we don't feel that close to him. And sometimes we feel like we can live within parts of both of these worldviews without realizing it. So we can separate ourselves from God just enough. And what happens, just as an example, and this will, will matter a little bit later as we talk about love further, but what can happen is, uh, an example is we can degrade the value of not just us, but of things like love along the way and the things around us, which end up devaluing us without realizing it. So, a good example of this. An apologist named Cameron McAllister unpacked this recently in a series of podcasts. I can tell him about you later. But uh, um, he says, love, if we biblically define it, is basically an act of will for the good of another person. And I think he's right. We often define love as simply the sort of, we, we do the softer virtue side of things, the squishy, feely kind of things, and feelings tend to crop up to the surface. But he says, actually, it's, it's an act of will towards somebody else for their good. The good it gives me is a byproduct of that. It's for their good. And we can see that in God through Scripture. But he says, what we tend to do with love in this, this sort of worldview that I'm talking about is we make it one of three things. Unconditional acceptance. You either take all of me or forget you. That's one way we do it. Uh, we take it as self-gratification and you can see that very clearly outlined in, in the uprising of pornography as an issue within our culture, that it really is just about self-gratification. And by the way, if you struggle with that, tell somebody else so you can be broken from that. Self-gratification. We can see that also in just simply the pursuit of happiness, that that seems to be the, the, the goal that so many of us have in life. I just want to be happy, and that's it, day to day. That's what we're seeking. Or we can see that we cheapen love and, and, as it turns out, devalue others along the way by just making it sentimentality. Life is a giant romantic comedy, right? We have these high expectations, and let's just face it, if, if we think life's like a romantic comedy, we're going to be let down every single time. It just never adds up to the movies. But love, in fact, is an act of will towards the other for their good. That's what it is. And we end up devaluing the person and the idea when we live in this worldview that, that can uh, uh, bring down the value of humanity. And that's really the power of sin is what that is. That it would devalue humanity. Now, I'll step away from the philosophical end of it 
because I don't know if you have the picture or if I just confused you. Um, I'm hoping I did the first. But Jesus gives us a promise. He says, I've come here. My sheep know my voice. And guess why I came? So that you could have life. I came so that you could have life. And you can see it on there. How much? To the full. The real deal. I came so you could have life to the full. And further, Paul uh, illustrates for us that in Christ, we become a new creation. That stuff that was vandalized, broken, damaged by sin that would allow us to devalue humanity, that would allow us to only put self at the center of things, that would allow us to devalue even love itself. That stuff, we're broken from that, put into a new sphere or we can be drawn close to the one who is holy. So in Christ, one of the things that is redeemed, we receive life and we get value back. We receive our value and our worth. Those are redeemed in Christ. Thanks be to God. Because they were broken by sin and we didn't even realize it. Now a second thing happens though. Um, And here I've got my second gospel story for you this morning. Israel Houghton. I don't know if you know his stuff. He's one of the top gospel writers right now. Uh, Very much like his stuff. He redid a song from the 90s recently called Trading My Sorrows. Some of you might remember it. We probably sang it here uh, in back many years ago. Um, I'm trading my sorrows, trading my pain, trading, laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And then it gets repetitive and says, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, times three. And then... Uh, but, but Israel Houghton just redid it within the past couple of years, and it's fun. Oh, it's fun. And he put some good chords, he put some good energy behind it, as he, only he can do. But, but when it gets to the bridge of the song, it says, though, though the sorrow may last through the night, your joy comes in the morning. Now, I love what he does. He, he moves to preacher mode in the live version of the song. And so the music keeps going. And he says, let me tell you, uh, joy comes in the morning. Morning doesn't just happen or have have an AM behind it. He says, morning happens when you wake up. And so he has people turn to their neighbor. I won't do it to you this morning. He has them turn to their neighbor. And he says, turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. He says, turn to them and say, joy is here. Wake up. I'm not hearing a single amen. For goodness sake, joy is here. Wake up. It's good stuff. This is good news. Now, here's the thing. When you receive Christ, you don't just receive life, you come alive. That's what's supposed to happen inside of you when you receive Christ. Life in Christ, we become a new creation. Human value is redeemed. And in Ephesians, Paul is telling us what's going on with that. He says, okay, you've got all these gifts. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's good. To do what? To equip us. To make us a people who otherwise were unvalued before it was broken by sin. Now we have value. Now we can see it in one another and we're brought together. We have unity. There's one body he's talking about. He says to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and what? Become mature. That's what he says. Become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we see this value redeemed. We see that as the people, we're supposed to have this unity to be involved in that very process, to see it in one another, that we can see the value in one another and help each other recognize the redemption of that. But here's the other thing. Your purpose is redeemed in Christ. And Paul himself, we didn't read it now. We heard it earlier. In the beginning of this very chapter, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord. He's a prisoner when he writes this. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received you ever think about the fact that you have a calling not just that you have a calling but the god of the universe the creator of all things gave you a calling if you're in christ your purpose has been redeemed and we're redeemed we gather together we have unity through redemption we have purpose we got a task to do brothers and sisters And maturity in that task matters. It's got to happen individually, and we've got to call one another and help one another grow into that maturity. So he continues on. And here's where those worldviews matter. He says in verse 14, when when we're 
doing this together, when we have the one faith, the one Lord, the one baptism, when we're recognizing all this, he says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. If we live under the wrong worldview, mired in sin, broken in sin, that's where we are. Whatever floats our way is the thing that we can latch on to. There's nothing holding us to anything else. He says, no, no, you've got a better way. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. That's who we're supposed to be. It happens on an individual level, but it happens with us as the body of believers recognizing our value and purpose together. And we are the ones who are called. What does that maturity look like? Paul's giving us some of that here. More broadly in the New Testament, I think uh, A.W. Tozer has summed up really well in, in about seven bullet points what maturity for the Christian looks like. Somebody who's been uh, renewed, who's reconciled, who's been redeemed. And here's some thoughts for you. Tozer points out that if you are in this camp looking for the fullness in Christ, your life is going to look like these things. You're going to be concerned with being holy rather than happy. Right? That changes the meaning of love partially there too. If love is, love is not just about self-gratification, it's about the good of another, and it's about the good of God too, who is good to us. It's about being holy rather than happy. If we're seeking Christian maturity as the body of believers, it means that we're going to seek God's honor advanced, even if it means suffering on our part, even if it means loss. That's our goal. If we're going to seek out Christian maturity, Tozer would tell us that it means to carry your cross, which means obedience through adversity, which means we carry on with this discipleship path following Jesus Christ, even when the crowd grows thicker and jeers at us, even when we feel bruised and bloodied walking forward, just like Jesus did. We continue on. But guess what? We have a body of believers to support us in that effort. If we're going to seek Christian maturity and what it's going to look like is we're going to try and see the world from God's viewpoint, which only comes from reading God's word to us and living that out together. If we're going to be mature, attaining the fullness of Christ, and if you want to write anything down, this is the one to write down, you, want to, you, you should have the desire to die right rather than live wrong. That's strong, isn't it? To die right rather than live wrong. If we're going to seek Christian maturity, we have the desire to see others advance at our own expense. This is particularly within the body. It's not about what I want. It's about who we're called to be. And finally, if we are, if we are going to show what Christian maturity is and live it out, we're going to habitually make eternity judgments, not time judgments. We know there's a day when we answer, but we know that there's a day when we get to stand in glory with God. When he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Those are the kind of decisions we make as mature believers. There is. There is a tendency to look back, though. There is a tendency, if you haven't received this, to think, what's this going to cost? There is a tendency sometimes when we walk forward carrying your cross, for instance, to think, boy, it would be easier if. We heard the story from Exodus 16 this morning. Uh, that's one that I've latched onto as uh, illustrative of who we shouldn't be in many cases, and sometimes we are, myself included. You have the Israelites who have watched the ten plagues in Egypt, who have been freed from bondage in Egypt, who have been chased by the Egyptian army, gone across the Red Sea where the waters were parted, and then the Egyptian army was folded over into the Red Sea. And then they stand in the desert as free people and say, Moses, why did you bring us out here? We're going to die in the desert. I wish we were back in Israel, or in Egypt. At least we had meat. At least we had food. Yeah, we were in bondage. It kind of stunk. But at least we had something to eat. You just brought us out here to starve. And God provides. And God opens the way for them to have something greater than they could have imagined. A deliverance greater than they could have imagined. Redeeming them from what was to what would be. And so often, we can have that idea that, that we can look back and we can say, God, this is harder than I thought. This Christian life you've called me to. And we had known our own experience uh, over the last couple weeks that just reminded us of what we get through Christ. 
you know, we, we, we were reflecting on our last three weeks have been kind of long. Um, for those of you that don't know our family situation, we have three kids. Our middle child has a, a muscle disorder. Eating has always been a challenge. Um, she was tube fed for the first two years. Then we got the tube out. We thought, hey, this is good. And as we reflected this story, we thought, well, that'll preach. And I asked her if I could share it. She said, I don't mind if you share. Um, I guess my kids like it when I talk about them publicly. They've said, so <laughs> that's dangerous. They'll learn later. But, but what happened is, long and short way around, she's basically becoming malnourished in the last few months. And our doctors were telling us, it's, it's time to put a tube back in and feed her by tube primarily so that she gets her calories safely and can grow. And it took us a long time. It took us months to, to really come to this conclusion thinking, but, but the cost of that, we know, what, we know what it was like before. We know some of the complications that we had. We don't want those again. We know some of the limitations that come with that. We don't want those again. We just kept thinking through what we thought were the costs. And then we finally said, we have to do this. And so we installed this little G button. She'll, remind, she'll correct me if I say it wrong. And she gets calories overnight, every night. And even in two weeks, she's gained two pounds. She gained three pounds last year. She gained two pounds. She's not always happier, but she's more happy. She's not always cheerier, but she's more cheery. She's not always running faster, but she's moving. You can see some results. Through Jesus Christ, we're offered living water, not just water that's going to make us thirsty again. Through Jesus Christ, we're offered food that's not going to make us want to eat. We're going to be offered the real stuff, and we will be strengthened by that and made into the mature Christ body that we're supposed to be. Do you see the, the corollary there? It's so, so clear to us. And we watched it happen tangibly. And that's what happens to us when we say yes to Jesus Christ. We're redeemed. Our value is redeemed. Our purpose is redeemed. And we're strengthened through that to experience the life that is truly life. Everything else is playing around up until that point. In Jesus, you're redeemed. And Jesus provides what no one else can give. Life. And guess what? Bonus. He gives it free of charge for you and me. The life that Jesus gives is worth the price of admission. It will be hard some days, really hard. But he gives us unity of faith with the body of believers. And you're redeemed, you're redeemed into this people and people around the world just like this. And you'll be strengthened by that. You'll be nourished by my food so that you can become mature like Christ, responding to the world in holy ways, in communion with the holy. Do you believe this morning that you have value? Do you believe this morning that you have purpose? And do you believe this morning that the God of the universe who created you gave you those, redeemed them when they were in danger? I want to pray this morning, and and I want to take time both. If you don't know Christ, I'm just going to give the invitation. And if you do know Christ, but you feel distant, I'm going to give you an invitation to draw close. So we're going to close our eyes all together. We're going to pray. And, and we're just going to take that time. God, in this moment, send your spirit into this place so that we know your presence. That life that is truly life, the life that you give us, the life that's not playing around but nourishes us like nothing else can, that draws us into your presence and changes us from the inside out so we respond to this world in ways that please you, that recognize you as our creator, you as the one who love us, that even bring us to fall to our knees recognizing your holiness but recognizing that you also are motivated by your love. God, that presence... Bring it here this morning. And if you're sitting here this morning and you think to yourself, I have never ever said yes to that life that is truly life that only comes through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through the self. It doesn't come through those around you. It doesn't come through your family. It only comes through Jesus Christ. If that's you, as all of our eyes are closed, raise your hand. And for those that are feeling far away, take this moment to ask God to come right in 
and show you what still remains unredeemed. What you still hold on to the tight hand that you need to hand over. Father, I lift us up as a body of your believers who recognize your goodness among us. And we pray that your presence goes before us, that as we leave this place, we would be the witness of what you've done in our lives through our work week and our school week, through our home life, through our life at the store. We pray that anywhere that we go, people would see your radiance from us, your glory. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.